Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Today, I have the pleasure of having Jason Olinger back on the podcast to discuss the development of apprenticeship programs. For those of you who aren't familiar with Jason, he is the lead automotive technician at Guatney Chevrolet and a General Motors master technician that specializes in Corvettes. He is a great mentor to apprentices in the Guatney Automotive Apprentice Program. He is also a graduate of the GM ASEP program at Oklahoma State University Institute of Technology and also serves on their advisory board. Currently, Jason is in his last semester of college to obtain his bachelor's degree of technology in technical leadership. Jason, pleasure to have you back on. How you doing, my friend? Doing good, Jay. How about yourself? I am great. I am excited to chat with you about your apprenticeship program. I think on the last podcast, we were really just kind of getting into the entry level of you putting together a program and and uh, excited to learn how that's going. Uh, but I do, as a car geek, have to ask, how are things going in the Corvette world? Uh, they're going good. It's it's summertime. Um, everybody's got their Corvettes out in springtime, so stuff's starting to break, and I'm really busy. <laughs> uh, just, got, how just got done with a uh, bunch of suspension work and kind of restro stuff on a 69. Um, Today we had two C8s, uh, a C6 that I'm rebuilding the EBCM one because you can't get them no more, and they just keep coming in. Wow. I, the range of technology from a 69 to a C8, uh, pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, – you know, people always say that the uh, older ones are easier to work on. I would I would disagree with that. You know, when I <laughs> when I went to school, they didn't even teach us about carburetors. It was all fuel injection, so, you know – um, everything I've learned about these quarter jets and stuff on these old cars, man, is just, I have to call mentors myself to figure those things out. You know, it's funny because if I work alongside my dad on a project or something, he'll make fun of me for not having any understanding of a carburetor and, uh, not being very good at them. And I, I grew up racing and, and we had carburetors on our cars and, uh, I never did any adjustments to it. We had a a friend, a family friend that knew how to do it and I never tweaked with them at all. And it was just because I didn't know anything about them. So I totally respect the fact that you, uh, you're able and willing to, to dive into something that is a little bit of an older technology now. Um, and not technology, just a, an older part or older system. Uh, but I think it takes having an open mind to do that too, right? Because it is, uh, I think if you learn it, it's really cool. It's just, it can be a little, little tough. Yeah. And, uh, in, in this world, the dealership style, you know, I, I bite off a little more than I can choose sometimes by wanting to do that because I want to learn how to do that. Right. So then it becomes me learning while I'm trying to be profitable for the business at the same time, you know, and it, sometimes it don't work out like that. Uh, you, you have to like the style of that that year of car though right that that is oh, such man. a such a cool car such an iconic car yeah it's a it's a beautiful car it reminds me of uh whatever apollo mission that was where they had the movie and they went up there to the moon and back and stuff and that car was like what the astronauts were driving <laughs> so you know what it always reminds me of <laughs> that's how back that's how far back that technology goes uh I had the opportunity to ride in uh, my first C8 back in January in Phoenix and what a trip man that was awesome like it, it is such a cool car and uh really fast haven't had the opportunity to ride in a Z06 yet but, but what a what a cool car Yeah I haven't I haven't had the chance to stretch out a Z06 yet cuz the ones I've had were still within the break-in period I did have a customer come take me for a ride in one but i haven't had the chance to drive one yet it's wild and not only the acceleration but the the braking ability as well it just the performance of that car is just on on just a different level i mean it's just so fun it is it's uh, the cornering abilities of that car so my my uh service manager has a c8 and uh, he does autocross so we get that thing set up with as much camber as you can all the way around lowered and and stiffer everything on it and uh it is a it is a trip to ride with him in one of those autocross events i i have always said i think uh i'm just more comfortable in the driver's seat than the passenger seat because the passenger seat to me is terrifying the the driver's seat at least you have some control 
when you're in that passenger seat and somebody's flying around in one of those cars, it uh, isn't always the most comforting feeling in the world. I'm the same. Yeah, I'd rather be in the driver's seat because I know. Well, this I know how hard I'm going to push something, and I know that the guy beside me is probably doing the same thing. So I don't I don't like that. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's always fun to talk to you about that uh, again as my car obsession I, I feel like i'm obligated to to ask about it or talk about it but uh the reason we brought you back on the podcast today one just from afar looking at what you're doing uh you know we had talked about what you're doing on tiktok you're still growing that presence i was able to check that out today uh for those of you that haven't watched jason and his tiktok videos uh, head out there there's some great education out there uh, you just put one out there that I thought was hilarious of you barbecuing uh, with the the hat on. Uh, it looked like you uh, you might have had a little fun uh, with uh, with some uh, smoking of meat that day or something. Oh yeah, yeah. We had a uh, for the fourth. We always have a family uh, rib competition with like about six or seven of the guys. And uh, yeah, I, I won it this I, year. So you won it? Yeah. What was your secret? Uh, I mean, just the way I prepare the ribs. I, I used to do barbecue competitions like for six years. I probably quit right before COVID or during COVID actually because everybody stopped getting together and doing stuff and I just hadn't really got back on the scene yet. But I mean, I got, uh, if you ever look up barbecue and ribs, look up Johnny Triggs 321 method. That's basically what I do. He's supposed to be known as the godfather of barbecue. Yeah. I need to write that down uh, because I am terrible at it. So I, uh, one of our, I'll give a shout out to uh, Matt Reynolds on our staff here at Wrenchway. He's our resident cook. And if we ever do an outing or we have uh, some meal day at the, uh, at the office, uh, he's, he's the one man in the grill. So he, uh, he's, he's really good at it. I, however, am very, very amateur at it. Not, not good whatsoever, but that's not why we're here to talk today. What we're here to talk today about is, uh, what you're doing with your apprenticeship program. Last time we chatted, it was really in that entry level phase of getting it off the ground and, and really trying to put something together. And I, I re remember thinking when we talked how, how forward thinking you were as a technician and wanting to put something together like this. And, and really, I want to revisit that a little bit because I want to talk about why it was important to you to even do this in the first place. A lot of technicians might not be as apt to, to go put together a program like this. Some technicians might love to do it, but not get permission from their uh, upper leadership. What was it to you that was important about putting something together a little bit more formalized than what you had in the past? Well, in the past, it was basically you bring somebody in, you stick them with a guy, either they work or they don't. Uh, our team got tired of seeing people just um, fail. Basically, you know, we don't have the we don't have the option anymore of let's just go to the next applicant, throw him out there. If it doesn't work, we'll go to the next applicant. It's not like it was in the '90s or the early 2000s anymore. Um, you don't have that constant flow of people that know what they're doing coming in. So we did try to do a you know experimental type stuff with apprenticeships where we just throw them and see if they stick. You know, and that didn't work. So we uh, we had to sit down and we actually had more meetings than I think we needed. It's one of those where you, you have so many meetings, you know, and you're like, okay, when are we going to kick the ball? We're just talking about kicking it. We got to kick, you know. I think we could have went probably four less meetings and got the ball rolling and learned on the go. And that's that's what we did. We basically got to that point and decided that. From my standpoint, the brunt of work that I had to do other than what I like doing because we didn't have the staff to to handle that workload you know we probably got we got really good technicians in our shop but we have three to four really good ones and if it comes down to it there's a problem that something can't handle one of us four have to take that on and you know looking at a short-term fix there wasn't one there for that so we we just decided that we needed to um, start our own curriculum and train somebody to be who we want to be uh, and that's that's the main focus for me as a technician standpoint was, hey, get some of this um, responsibility off of. I need somebody that can handle some of this workload that I have to handle along with trying to be 
productive and take care of my family at the same time. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like, I like that honesty and that candor there and, and why you wanted to put together a program. I think you could have said something very fluffy and, and, and made it sound good, but it was, you know, really trying to grow that next generation because it does take maybe some of that load off of your back and maybe some of those jobs that you're quite frankly overqualified for uh, to, to be able to, to grow that so that it's not so dependent on you. I actually had a technician at one point that I was talking to probably within the last six months that said uh, we were talking about the technician shortage and his take was a little different than that, right? His take was that, you know, Jay, I'm a technician. Why would I want this to get any better? I'm being treated better than I ever have been. Uh, tech, you know, uh, dealerships and shops in general are desperate for technicians and I feel like I'm in a point of, of leverage here when it comes to, you know, negotiating with a shop. I like your stance probably better there because it does help take some load off of you and it does help you work on the jobs that you most enjoy and that you're probably best at. And, you know, it, it, I think it, it was refreshing to hear what you just said there. I, and I think that's, that's what I would try to get as a take home for most technicians is that the industry, whether we say it or not, has given most of us a lot of really, really good things. Uh, and whether that's the, the skill, uh, the tools, you know, it, there's just so much that comes along with it. But I, I like your, uh, I like your stance there. And I think it's, uh, it's really honest, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I could have fluffed it up, you know, but I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no reason for that. Cause that's, that's what we've been doing for years. And that's why we're in this position, you know, because everybody keeps beating around the raw problem and the, the raw truth of what we need. Um, another thing was, you know, not even looking at it from my exact point of view, but uh, just for the company in general, onboarding isn't cheap. And if we continue to have to uh, onboard people all the time, there's nothing there. And then we, then we start to look like we have high turnaround, right? Because you got people coming in and out just because they couldn't cut it. So we didn't want it. We got tired of seeing failure. We got tired of seeing our people that, uh, are capable of doing everything, getting overworked. And we just got tired of spending money on all the onboarding, you know? So let's let we put something on the ground, put something in the paper to uh, kind of ease that, that problem with all of us. Did you hear the news? Wrenchway is launching local chapters across the U S Wrenchway local chapters bring together the best shops and dealerships with schools, technicians, and other industry professionals with the goal of promoting and improving auto and diesel careers in local communities. Wrenchway's local online communities provide a detailed look at what it's like working at the best shops in the area, an effective way for schools to connect with local shops and dealerships an engaging forum for members to discuss industry topics, and a fun way to win prizes while helping industry and local schools. Wrenchway local chapters are now available in Charlotte, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denver, Detroit, Houston, Indianapolis, Madison, Milwaukee, the Twin Cities, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Portland, and Raleigh, with more chapters coming soon. Learn more and join wrenchway.com slash local dash chapters. Link is in the show notes. Do you think, does it put you in a weird mindset when a young person comes in and say you do have that high turnover of like, hey, this person's coming in, they'll be here for three months and gone, and maybe I don't want to invest much of my time into that person because you know, the track record hasn't been great. We bring them in and spit them up, eat them up and spit them out, right? Uh, did you see that in, in your shop prior to kind of putting this together? Yeah, we had a few that done that. They come in, you know, and they look, they actually looked real promising. We had one that kind of used us and moved on to the trucking industry, but that, that was in his plan all along. Uh, we had two more like we done, you know, you throw it on the wall and see if it sticks. We, those guys, they, uh, we use them a lot. We've done some exit interviews with them and found out where do you think we dropped the ball, you know? And we didn't have a kind of structured curriculum for them. 
it was just, hey, learn as you go. You know, like that's how a bunch of us actually done it back in the day and it worked. But there's a lot more technical stuff now. You know, these these guys that we brought in, we want them to do electrical up front because everything involves electrical. Figure out your Ohm's law, your basic stuff, you know, know how to do a voltage drop test, load test. And uh, then we go from there. But those other guys, we never really gave them that that structure to start with. So they had nowhere to start, so it was over before it started, basically. It's how, how it went with those guys. And I uh, wish we would have done something better with them, but I, I still talk to those guys, and, and we learned so much from that experience to help us put down on paper what we were doing with this program. A very key piece of what you just said there was that, one, you did an exit interview, uh, which we should all be doing that, right? Every shop should be doing that. I think it's a great way to learn where we can improve, but then you actually listened to that exit interview and took pieces out of that and, and probably agreed with them. Right. And said, yeah, we, we don't have much around this. And you could see where I think shops mentalities, the good ones anyways, are changing there uh, from the, you know, I learned the hard way. So you have to learn the hard way mentality to we, we've just got to do this better. And the fact that it took you from there to, okay, let's write out a plan. Let's start actually putting some thought into this is a huge credit to you and the dealership, because that is not something that's easy to do to kind of take a step back and think through it, especially when we're trying to put out our, our daily fires, but it is really interesting. So I'm curious as to you have that exit interview, you know, you've got to put more, more of a plan in place where do you even start at that point? Where where did you start in terms of starting to lay out a program? So we started with, we wanted to have applicants that we thought would work. So we got with this company called Preview that does um, um, basically personality test. Uh, you know, like a bunch of companies do it before you start. You do a personality test, aptitude test, stuff like that. Uh, we wanted to, we wanted a physical aptitude test, but those things cost a lot of money. I know when uh, I went to work for the railroad at one time, they paid, I don't know how much, but I'd done a physical test to show my skills and all that stuff. And we started looking into that and there's nowhere around that's cheap to do that. So we, um, we got with this company preview and we had the top technicians in the shop that we thought would be good personality traits and team fit traits and stuff like that. Uh, take the test and we made our own, um, basically scale of where we would like to see somebody land. It's not a deciding factor when you pick somebody. Uh, and we had all of our applicants. I think at first we had 15 applicants for this program. We had them take that. And the closest to what we thought was there is what we went with just to see. Uh, retrospect, it might not have been the best deciding factor. We We, we had great applicants come in. But I did see some areas where we needed um, probably to get better scores on for somebody to, to work in this industry. Saying I'll have to say this, we the first thing we wanted to do was vetting people. We wanted to get somebody in here that would be susceptible to us teaching them things, but also had, you know, what seemed like good work ethics and, and um, personality close to what our top techs were. So that's one of the first things that we hashed out during this apprentice program was who are we going to bring in? Once we had that figured out, the curriculum part wasn't that bad. Uh, General Motors has a, a pretty good training setup that we just piggybacked off of. And we go through there and we find uh, assignments and stuff to assign the apprentices to do. And we really want to keep them in line, like the work they're doing during the day, we want to be with the work they're learning at night on the computer-based uh, curriculum stuff. That doesn't work. <laughs> it's, it's hard It's hard to make that work, you know? And we have two mentors, me and another guy, and um, we both do different type of work. He does more transmission work. We can both do everything, but he does more transmission work. I do more electrical and Corvette stuff, just anything on a Corvette. And one thing I found difficult was letting a brand new apprentice work on a Corvette that cost $100,000. You know, it, it, to me, 
it made me as a mentor more of like a, I hovered the whole time instead of let the person um, make a mistake like my, my co-part would. He didn't care. If they broke an ear off of a bell housing, so be it. Me, I feel like I got a reputation to uphold for my work and, you know, my customers, they might not want to see something happen that an apprentice broke on their car, right? So it was a struggle getting in the different type of work that they could work on on their rack knowing that I had this amount of cars that I have to get out at a certain amount of time and I have this helper here with me. So in one part, I leaned on them to help me get stuff done, which probably lacked in the education part some. Uh, and the other part is I hovered and didn't let them break stuff on their own or find out the hard way that my, my other, the other mentor would definitely let them do. So, um, in finding that out, we kind of had to switch gears and we just swapped apprentices. Said, hey, I think th I think his teaching style will benefit the one that I've had. And I think my teacher's talk can benefit the one he's had, you know. And that's one thing we had to change along the way. Uh, that's interesting, though, because I think that's a really important point in how people learn. It could be different in how they accept the teaching from you and a lot of it aligns with personality and how, you know, your personality jives with the other person, with the, uh, the mentor mentee and that type of relationship. A uh, lot of credit to the two of you for, for understanding that and swapping apprentices because it probably benefited everybody at the end of the day. I have to assume. Yeah, I would, it definitely did. The, uh, my apprentice, when he went to him, um, got to do a lot more hands-on and stay busy all day. A bunch of the stuff I done for them was advanced at the time and was hard to explain all the diagnostic I was doing. And if you're mentoring somebody, you can't just go in there and I know how to check. I got an electrical problem, for instance, okay? I know if I got a wire that's bad, I go in there and I check to see if it's shorted to ground, shorted to power, shorted to some other wire or open. That's basically what the flow chart's going to tell you in about three pages. I know to go do that. But I can't just say it to this person, anybody that's getting into this field, and them understand that. I found that out. Uh, so I went back and I watched some, I watched some YouTube videos of how um, basic high school electrical teachers teach automotive electrical and all that stuff. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm, I need to break it down a little farther. Um, so that's when you got to go through the whole flow chart with them. You, you got to do everything and explain why they're wanting you to do this step. Cause if you just go at it, like I know what I'm doing, they're not going to pick it up. That was a problem that we had to jump over. Also was the, the, uh, I guess the education gap of breaking everything down. You know, I know how hard is it? Like how hard is it to get them to read the flow chart, but then not live by the flow chart after that, right? Because I think in a lot of cases, and I think I was guilty of this early on in my career was, I, you know, I, the flow chart was, <laughs> that was what you followed, right? You followed that process. And a lot of times you're not, you know, I think what it does is it forces you, it, it doesn't force you to think as much. And I, one thing again, that I love that you said right there is that you took a little bit of time to explain why you're looking at this one thing or this one step in a flow chart. And I, I do think there's a huge advantage to just taking a few more minutes and explaining the why behind it, because otherwise it can become really easy for a young tech to just kind of, Hey, I'm following the steps that they have laid out here and not actually think about the problem. Yeah, exactly. One of the, one of the proudest moments I had mentoring was, uh, I pulled in a vehicle and I knew what it was right off the bat. Had a code for evap code for a purge valve. I knew the purge valve was going to be bad. Well, I let him have it. I said, here it is. Here's the code. Go find it out. I see him get in my toolbox, pull out a light, plug it in to where the purge valve plugs in, and then operate it with the uh, scanner on and off. And he said, well, that works. That means the purge valve's bad. And I was like, that's it. It's clicked. That's great. You know, I, uh, I probably bragged on that too much to management. I, I was happy for him, man. That was that was good work, you know. Well, and you're building confidence there too, right? Because when yeah. when they start to figure that stuff out, then it 
you know, then you are thinking through it a little bit differently and, and not so reliant on a, a flow chart or, you know, not thinking through what the problem is. And with diagno like the diagnostic piece of a technician, confidence is such a big factor, isn't it? I mean, you've got to have a, that ability to, I don't know, just kind of pump yourself up and, and know that what you're going to do is uh, the right thing to do. You know, I, I just feel like confidence is such a big step in a young technician there. Yeah. Yeah. And you could see it with him the, the next couple of days. It was just, he'd done something, you know, it was there. And he was, Love it. yeah, built the confidence. Yeah, it was good. How did you go? So uh, when you said when, when you're doing kind of the base level education, whether it is that voltage level or that voltage drop test or anything else, are you teaching them ahead of time or are you teaching them that on a car? It's on a if car. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. So they have training that they do online and it teaches them and it, you actually use the mouse to drag your leads where they go and stuff like that on our training. Um, but anybody in this industry, there might be some that learn from doing the book work. Okay. But we all know how people learn. You either mess up or you put your hands on it and you figure it out by doing it with your hands. Uh, so basically the teaching part was hands on it, it's on a car. That's how we find out. And it's really hard to get, it's so sporadic, the type of work we get, you know, you can't lay it out yeah. like you were in a school setting where you bug a car. Now we are going to bug a car. It'd be the final exam type deal. We're going to do some pretty cool stuff we got planned, but uh, yeah, just the everyday running in and out, trying to maintain business and teach. It's a, it, it's more of a struggle than I thought it would actually be in the beginning. Yeah, it, I, I can imagine. And going back to when you're writing out the initial plan compared to what the program actually looks like, have to imagine it's a little different than maybe what your initial plan was. It is. It is. We, uh, the time frame was one that we had. We, we never set a time frame because we didn't know. There, there's no way to know how long it's going to last. But we wanted some kind of idea of a time frame. We were thinking like a year and a half, year. If we wanted to stick with the high school and the college graduation type deal, it had to be yearly to keep the program going. Okay. And then we also, ran into the problem of, so we get done with these guys, they work for us. How, how much capacity can we handle for the program? You know, so that was an issue that we didn't see in the beginning that coming close to the end, we're like, okay, if we, we continue to work out, there's going to be a certain point where we got to shut down or we're going to be teaching guys for other shops, right? So we're looking into that right now. <laughs> That's one of the. It's tough though. Yeah, it's we're probably going to have a meeting pretty pretty soon. We're probably going to call a meeting and try to get a handle on that. I think where you get to there though is so cool because then, when you don't need the people as much, right? You're not desperate to get technicians in the door because you started that steady pipeline of technicians. I think it allows you to be more selective in that vetting process, right? Because you are able to see more people and you're maybe able to talk to more and get more options in terms of the young people that you're bringing in the door. And I also see the, the other challenge of that being, you know, when you are at capacity, it's so hard to predict staffing, you know, changes that are going to happen. And so it's easy to say, well, just keep running the program, just keep running the program. But when you're, you get to a point where you're overstaffed, it's very difficult to, to maintain that because there is some level of investment from, from the shop side that you're, you know, you're allocating time of really valuable people to, to help run that, that program. I can see where maybe the lack of consistency could make you fall off the program though. Right. And I think that's the hardest part to, to try and get around is, okay, you started this program, you've had success, you're really starting to learn how to educate these young people, you get to capacity, you table the program, and then maybe that program doesn't come back, or it doesn't come back as strong as it could if you just kept it going. Is that kind of one of your concerns as, as you're building this thing out? Yeah, that is a concern for sure. We don't want to 
yeah, we don't want it to get tabled. And then, you know, all the effort we've put into it, it seems like it's for, we got three good techs out of it, you know, and we can't do nothing else. Now, we do have another dealership that we could probably send somebody to and uh, they're on board with the program. I don't know how far they've got with it. We've kind of been the spearhead at this dealership. But, and we're also trying to get our body shops on board because they're, they're in more of a hurt than we are actually, you know, I think, I can't remember what the average age was. I think it was like 62 or something like that, or for the body guy. I don't, I don't know. It's up It It was an amazing stat when I heard it. I was like, wow, they're, they're in a bigger frying pan. We are over here. You know, <laughs> I hear that across the industry too. You know, we've got, uh, starting to get more and more, uh, collision shops on, Wrenchway, and I honestly don't know that I knew their need was as bad as it is. And I, I do think what you've done is you start to put together the framework of a program. And once you start to kind of piece that together, you learn and you tweak. And I, I think to me, that's the best way to, to do a program. And, uh, you know, when you talked about having the meetings to have the meetings, right, and and being able to actually put it into action. I think that's such a big piece of it is you're not going to know everything up front when you go into this, right? You're, you're going to have to lay it out. I think each shop is going to be different in how their program runs. Uh, but would you have advice for that shop that's out there listening right now about things you've learned over the course of this, uh, whether, you know, the initial kind of plan of how you drew it out, uh, it sounded like maybe too many meetings to start off with, but any advice to those shops that are out there on, on how to do this right? There's a lot of information on the web. I looked at um, uh, a bunch of stuff in Canada. It seems like to get, what is that, Red Seal certified or something Red like Seal. that? Yep. Yeah, they have apprentice programs that they go through to get that. And, and they have a lot of their stuff outlined online. And I got a lot of information for what we done from them. Um, just, you know, the structure of the general different parts of automotive that you want to do. I found that online. Uh, a big piece of advice, though, is, is put it all on paper and get some people together that, you know, um, are willing to come up with great ideas, but change their ideas with other people's thoughts. You don't want somebody uh, over that program or, or in that meeting that it's their way or the highway type stuff. You know, you need somebody that has good experience, good um, knowledge of what they're doing and has good sound advice to, to get that going. And if you don't have that, I could see it derailing very quickly if it's all somebody's ideas because I've, I've had a lot of ideas that were taken into this, but I've had a lot that I shot out that, that weren't taken. Uh, and it's going to be different for each shop. I believe once you, once you outline what you need, it's, it's what you need and what you want as an end result. You know, that's how you set it up. Uh, if you, if you just want somebody that's good at doing maintenance, I, I could see you setting up just a maintenance program. So, Hey, this is what we want. Let's start here. Do you know how to, tighten lug nuts, you know, so the wheel don't fall off or something. Uh, basically, I think you could put everything into one encompassing outline of vetting, curriculum, who's going to be your teachers, and what are you going to do with the guys after they're done with the program? And maybe in between there, what decides they're done with the program? Is there a mm. test? Is there... Is there uh, just amount of time. Is there a certain amount of training you want them to achieve? You know, you got to set that goal. Ours is we have a certain amount of training. We want them to achieve percentage wise on the general motors training website. And then we're going to give an exit exam and they have to do, be able to go get a car from a service advisor, uh, get the auto themselves, diagnose the vehicle, fix it, story it correctly with cause com complaint and correction or complaint cause and correction and then deliver the car to the customer happily. That's gonna be part of the test. You gotta do that by yourself, you know? And of course, before we do that, we want them to do a few of those by themselves while we're watching, you know? But that's gonna be basically the springboard right there. Once you reach that level of training, uh, once we knock off the benchmarks that we've set up, that we've viewed you do this efficiently, 
and you can do that one car and you pass our last exam, which is going to be some bug vehicles, then you're done with ours, you know, and you're, and it's up to you to negotiate after that with the, uh, the service manager, what you're going to get paid at that point. Do you, do you see that maybe taking on even more of an evolution of the program as the, you know, once you're finished off with your uh, apprenticeship time and you pass the test given by the shop, that maybe that starts to, to put you into a, a career ladder uh, of some type, right? Like, of, of hey, now that you've completed this, you're able to maybe have a standard of, okay, you're going to move into this role, this is what it's going to pay, and so it's not even like a negotiation, or do you just always see like, hey, these these people are different. Everyone that comes out is different, and each one, each pay scale should be accordingly, uh, match that accordingly. So you're, no matter what the program does, if you if you start out as an A, let's say an A tech and a and a C tech, okay, that C tech can have a great career doing this, but they may never be able to be an A tech. That's just that's just the reality of it, right? So as long as they make it through the program and they're there, I think it's still going to be a, a negotiation type situation of to what do you bring to the table, right? I believe we do have a set rate. Actually, I know we have a set rate as soon as they graduate. But from there on, deciding on how much you're doing your ASEs, the training, how much you pursue yourself is basically what's going to set your pay. I like that. I think that's a totally fair thing, and I'm interested to to hear, do those young techs typically have an idea where they stand after they, you know, do you get the sense that they will have an understanding of where they they stand at in relation to, you know, if they're comparing themselves to you or to uh, maybe one of the peers that they're with, you know, as to what level they're actually at? Because... I think that's one of the hardest parts with a lot of young techs is maybe they, they, I don't want to say they think they're better than they are, but maybe they are, you know, a hard charger and they, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm a B tech. Right. And in reality, maybe they're a C tech and it's hard to hear that. Uh, do, do they have a pretty good sense of where they stand when, when you kind of get your hands off of them a little bit? I believe they will. We, so throughout the program, something I failed to mention is we do have, um, quarterly checkups we'll give them Love a that. sheet and have them we'll have them rate themselves you know one through five five being i'm completely sufficient at this task or one i have no clue what i'm doing uh, we'll have them fill out their own report uh bring it to us we'll all meet in the service manager's office and uh, ask them why they felt that way and then if i have anybody has any reason not to believe that they're not there we'll let them know uh, last time we had one, they, they felt like they got beat up a little bit, but we brought them back up. We, we told them the good things they've done and what we've seen. And it's it's not always going to be, you know, roses and champagne. So uh, sometimes you got to get talked to a little tough, you know, and it's just how it was. And uh, I think they come out of there knowing where they were. Uh, we got another one coming up. And uh, since that last time, we've actually had one of the apprentices leave the program. So. Uh, we only have one right now, so we're actively looking to add another. Uh, it was a, it wasn't really because he couldn't cut it. He had a lot of stuff going on personally. I don't think it, I think it was a time thing for this apprentice. He had so much going on outside of work that he couldn't really concentrate what was going on at work. So, want to win cash while helping the industry? Check out our weekly game on Wrenchway Shop Talk called The Loneliest Number. Each week, we post short poll questions on Shop Talk about industry topics. Technicians who answer the questions will earn points to play the loneliest number game for a chance to win our $1,000 weekly prize. $500 will go to the lucky winner, and the other $500 will go to a local high school program of the winner's choice. Start playing now at wrenchway.com slash shop talk. Link is in the show notes. How I want to talk about the conversation that you had in kind of that evaluation period. And I do think it's so important to give good candid feedback to an employee 
uh, to let them know where they stand. I think if you don't do that, you're, you're doing them a disservice because it might lead them to think differently than, than maybe what the, the, the reality is. But when you're sitting down and maybe your scorecard doesn't match what their scorecard says and you're giving them that tough feedback, is it tough to, to bring them back from that conversation? Uh, I mean, is it tough to get their confidence back or is it, you know, you leave that in a pretty good spot and maybe they have a better understanding of where they're at? Well, what we've done is we, we went over the harsh stuff first and they let me kind of be the, uh, the a-hole, if you will, <laughs> be the tough one. And then uh, we just, we brought them back up and we actually gave them goals to meet uh, for a, for a raise actually in that meeting. And, uh, it, it, I think they knew exactly where they were. I wouldn't like to leave it. You know, it's just like when I get on to my kids, I don't ever, I don't ever not tell them I love them after I spank them. You know, it's something like that. I don't, I don't want to leave it there for them to think it's worse than it really is. You know, I could understand some management styles doing that, but that's, that's, that's not what I would ever do. I think if they know, you have their best interest in mind. That goes so far, right? In in any type of leadership position, uh, they always talk about they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And I think that that piece is that, especially as it relates to dealing with a young technician, and and you don't want them to lose confidence. You don't want them to lose the love for working on cars or trucks or whatever it might be but you also have to be able to give them good feedback so that they can get better. And, and I think you, you hit on it perfectly right there in that you, you want them to know that you care that, that you do have their best interests in mind. I agree. So as we look at this and you, you put the program together, uh, you put a lot of thought into the program and, those tweaks, you know, we, we talked about having to adapt and, and make changes as you go. Was there anything that surprised you that you, you maybe thought would work better than it did or vice versa? I thought we would move a lot faster than we did. That's, that's the main thing that surprised me. I thought the, um, of course, at first I had it. I had it set in quarters of what, this is what would be taught. This is what will be taught. And going back to what I said, that's impossible with the different amount of work that comes in. You can't teach everything hands on that you want to in the time frame that you want, or at a certain time that you want. Um, both of our apprentices are amazing at pulling transmissions. Six L eighties and eight L nineties all day with the transmission guy, you know, but. Uh, you can't, you can't just break down electrical diagnostic. That's why one of the hardest hurdles was electrical because it, it it's sporadic when it comes in, you know. And then uh, another thing is trying to teach the finesse of um, pulling body panels apart, just like door trim and stuff like trim inside of a car. It's uh, a lot of people don't have that, you know. And and we got lucky. These these guys they they're pretty good on trim. But I've seen I've seen people come in that. Um, just rip a door apart. You know, I don't, I don't know what they're thinking, but I was really worried about that. And I was surprised by the fact that these guys were so, I guess I wouldn't use gentle, but they had the finesse to not break stuff. You know, I what expect an underrated front, skill. Yeah. I expected up front. Uh, we had, we didn't have a number put together, but we knew we were going to pay for some broke parts. You know, we just expected it. And uh, I think the worst we've probably been out is $500 this whole time, which is credit to them, you know, Either they're looking back at it, either they're they're too scared to break something, so they're being slow and taking their time on everything, or uh, they're actually pretty good. So I don't know. Either one of them's going to happen. That is a an incredibly underrated skill. It's one that I really sucked at when I was in the shop. Uh, of you know the those that finish type work is is very challenging. Uh, one thing I found interesting as you were talking earlier in the podcast is how fast you start them on the electrical side. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that can be a really intimidating thing for a young tech to go in and learn that, especially the intermittent problems and 
being able to really think through a problem and, and trying to fix it. How do you take that intimidation away of, of the electrical side? I just start slow. So both of them were into um, speakers and stuff. You know how high school kids are. They're putting speakers in their cars and stuff. So they kind of had a little bit of knowing how to run wires and tie them together. We had to get them away from the house, twist nuts, you know, and stuff like that. But <laughs> or using the scotch locks, whatever. But I think I still I, have buddies doing that. <laughs> yeah. Man. I hate when I see a trailer come in. My trailer lights don't work. It's the truck's problem. No, that's that's not it. But I don't I don't know if there is a way to take away the intimidation. Just break it down and show them how simple it is. If you've seen some of my TikTok videos when I I had people asking, I just done a simple voltage drop test one time and I just hundreds of questions on what I've done. And I was like, okay, people need to know this. Let's, let's see how simple we can make it, you know? And it, it's, it's basically, they're going to get intimidated regardless. So you, you put it out there in front of them and see what they don't understand. And you just keep backing up and getting easier and easier until you start, you know, grabbing them. Isn't that a microcosm of the industry though, is you put a TikTok video out there about voltage drop. I think we assume most technicians know how to do a proper voltage drop test, but then when you see the questions come through in a in a in an area where maybe that tech doesn't feel like they're going to be exposed for not knowing it and they can actually freely ask questions, I think that tells you how much of a need there is for a better understand a better understanding on the electrical side, right? It was when they get in an environment where they they can ask questions and they feel safe to ask questions and aren't going to feel like an idiot when they ask those questions. Uh, it, it probably does help them get a much better understanding. And, and I, I do think there's a lot of that in our industry where maybe even if you don't fully understand it, you'll maybe kind of just, yeah, I got it and go through yeah. and not fully have a comprehension of what you're doing. Well, most of it's the pride that technicians have in themselves. They got so much pride in themselves. They don't want somebody to know they have a weakness, you know? Uh, yeah, and that, going back to the TikTok thing, um, I like that app because the negativity I can keep, I can control the negative negativity on my platform. I can delete bad comments when they get on there, you know. And that's one thing I really hate. And you were hitting on that just now is they were feeling like they're somewhere they can ask questions freely without being made fun of. And, and people still try to make fun of people, but uh, I get rid of those comments quick, you know. I try to keep it to where. Um, it's all positive and somebody's learning, you know, but I don't back, back get to the that. Apprentice, yeah. Back to the apprentice though. Uh, they, you know, we might be a little rough on them at times, but we never actually tell them they're stupid. I, I don't think anybody would ever do that with an apprentice program. Um, you never, you always try to, I try to downplay the faults more than I should probably. Uh, if you want me to be honest with that, but anytime there's a chance to like, you know, take a jab, I might throw a little jab, but I'm going to, I'm going to come back with you with some knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's basically the same thing. It, it crosses over from that platform to me teaching. It's, let's keep it positive and uh, keep it educational, you know? Yeah. I, I, I like that. And I, I do think giving them little jabs and, and, you know, I think that makes them pe feel as part of the team, right? Because they see everybody else doing it. And, and, you know, I, I think when you know that line where it's not going past that and making fun of them, but actually helping them out. And then, you know, it's not a bad thing to give them a hard time. Like they, it, it, I think that, that helps grow your culture and it helps, you know, it, it helps have fun in the shop, right? Like it's, it, we work too hard at this to not have fun. And, um, I think that's a, I think that's a really solid approach. Cool. What, uh, when uh, another thing that I wanted to maybe revisit was the vetting process when you're bringing people in. And I think a lot of times that can be very difficult with a young person. You're going through, uh, some of those tests to be able to, to tell if they've got the chops to, to stick out in the shop, right. And, and stand in this career, when you're looking at that, have you been able to, I mean, has there been a good correlation to that testing and what you've done on the front side to kind of how you've seen them progress? Uh, does it match kind of 
what you thought they would be when when they get into the program? Yeah, I would say we're. I would probably give it eighty percent confidence that it was absolutely correct on the on the personality side test and the uh, the ability side. Uh, I don't put a whole lot of weight on that one. I don't think we're going to use that much in the future to to weigh heavy on the uh, vetting process. But the personality side, uh, both of them were pretty much right on what we needed. What did you learn from when you were, you were kind of setting that baseline of what a good tech looks like? And I will give a, a shout out to uh, our friend Mark at Job Behaviors, they they do a lot of that type of testing and and any anywhere from like NFL football players all the way to you know truck drivers, you know just a, a, everything in between. And I've learned a lot from what he's talked about in how they assess people. But in your experience, when you're looking at the best techs in your shop, what types of traits do they have? What are, what types of things are you looking for when you're when you're bringing that young person in? They are so we all scored high on I can't remember what exactly it reads like, but it was things, just uh, physical things. We were all very high on that. Uh, shapes we were high on. Uh, reading we were middle on reading. Uh, math we were middle. But it seems like our best, our best text we have, uh, I think the things and the shapes are more of a hands-on type, you know. The visual. More, yeah. And uh, when they're high on those, it seems to be they're going to be a good fit for this. So that would probably make it fairly obvious then. We talked about the computer training versus the on-hands training. And that's why the on hands the hands on training works better is because that's the way you think right you you the, that's the way you use your hands to learn something and maybe seeing jason do a voltage drop test helps me visualize you know not only just the test itself but you know how you pull a connector apart right like i i think something that sounds very simple some of the connectors on these cars are really hard to get apart and you, <laughs> i if you don't have the right tool to pull them apart or you don't have the patience i mean some of those really suck like to be yeah. frank <laughs> to pull apart I remember, I remember when the uh the full-size trucks and suvs i think it was like 2018 or 17 they come out with a new connector under the seats and it was like a had a twist lock on you had to twist it and then pull a tab to undo it i figured it out because i had one of the first ones but after that and everybody knew i knew how to do it jason come on do this connector you know <laughs> man guys it's simple just re you know but yeah that, and they're always changing them they're never the same it seems no. like every every different model that comes out we got to learn how to undo a new connector <laughs> and, the, and the smaller they make them dust really affects them i found that out you get a little bit of dust and a little bit of connector for like a uh, exhaust baffle. And that thing right there will be a pain until you blow it out. And then it just feels like nothing. It's one of those things that sounds very, very simple, but it can throw your entire day off, right? Like if, if you're struggling to get that connector off and, you know, you're pissed because you couldn't get it apart. And then, you know, you're, you're trying to think through a diagnostic problem and process, but you're still irritated that, that, you know, oh, yeah. either you couldn't get the, you couldn't get it apart or maybe you scraped your hand when you did it or, you know, like there's so many variables with something like that. And, you know, one of the really stupid things that I'll admit to when I was a young technician was trying to figure out where the connectors were too, right? Like it, it like it sounds so obvious and so easy, like, when you're looking at a schematic and then you're trying to find, you know, where that, uh, that cab harness runs or, you know, what, wherever, like, but just locating the, the proper spot to be testing. Right. It's just those little things that if you can get those down, you know, and then you're just focused on the test itself rather than the frustration of trying to dig through a, a wire loom or do some, <laughs> something like that. Uh, I, I think that's kind of an underrated 
really hard thing to do at times that that maybe we don't take as uh, as serious as we should. Yeah, and then by the time you're to that point, you get to the wire you're testing and the schematic's wrong. <laughs> That's how it that works. never happens, Jason. Oh, man. <laughs> but I, I think when we're looking at putting together an apprenticeship program and, and any type of training program for technicians, that's the little stuff that can go a long way. You know, advice on how to get a connector apart, maybe a special tool that you need uh, to be able to do something. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of young technicians, they'll struggle th- – to try and figure out something or try to get something apart and then find out that there was a special tool that was needed. So it's like the basics are so important for a good young technician to get down because then they can concentrate on the hard stuff, right? Like if if you can get that simple stuff down, that frees your mind up to be able to actually think about stuff. Yeah. If you can start them with that and they're able to grow off that, you know, with the little simple things and that's, that's what you want. And it's crazy the amount of stuff that I take for granted that I don't think is, is, is something amazing to somebody else. You know, like the, uh, the putting the oil filter cap where the hood closes. So you don't forget to put oil in the car. You know, um, I, I showed them to hang a red rag on the, uh, steering wheel to remind them, Hey, I done brakes. I probably need to pump the brakes or something. I worked at a dealership a while back when I was going through school and one of the guys backed off the front end rack into the bathroom and wedged the door and there was a salesman stuck in there for like two hours till we cut the door open. You know, so. <laughs> so every time, we could do a podcast just on that, on that story. Every, every time I'm teaching somebody new about brakes, I tell them that story. I was like, you don't want to be that guy. He took a Cadillac DTS right into the bathroom. You know? <laughs> yeah. Do you and do... And this is back before we had good cell phones. All he was able to play was like Snake or something on his phone while he was in there, you know? <laughs> that's a first one. I, I've not heard a story like that before. That That's good. Do you do any TikToks on that type of stuff? I, I, I can't recall if I've seen any that you've done on just like basic tips to make sure you keep yourself out of trouble a little bit. Yeah, I have, but I got tired of the... Uh... I got tired of the general public out there saying stuff like, well, if you got to have something to remind you when you're doing a brake job, you don't want to be turning wrenches, you know, just the people doing that. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll see myself do something and somebody's like, hey, that was cool. And I'll be like, oh, okay, I need to make a video about that because I didn't realize. Didn't think about it. Yeah, I didn't realize that, that was something that people needed to know. Yeah. I, yeah, that's the frustrating part, of I think, about the general public and even – you know, for Wrenchways TikTok, I see some of the comments out there and you're like, my goodness, you know, we we talk about evolving this industry so that techs get better respect and that, you know, that we get the credit we deserve from a technician standpoint. But there's so many comments that I read out there on social media where I'm like, my goodness, we're, we're going backwards here. Like there, yeah. there's there's uh, there's a time and place for it. I, it's just a matter of like, if, if we really want to get to the point to where we need to be in terms of respect level, pay level, whatever it is, uh, we got to act like professionals, right? And, uh, you know, for from my standpoint and seeing what you do out there and the fact that you took the initiative to put together a program like you did and that you're learning from this program and you're tweaking and you're making adjustments to, to really make it a valuable program – is awesome. Uh, can't give you enough credit for that. I also think that it's very cool that you you're pushing to the capacity of the staff, right? It, that you know you're almost you're almost putting too many technicians through. Uh, but just so much credit to you and what you're doing, Jason. You, you know I'm a, a huge fan of everything you do. Uh, the TikTok side is amazing, uh, but uh, but just the 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 thought of putting a program together, actually putting it on paper, executing on it and learning from it, knowing that you don't know everything about, you know, how to, how to educate these people and adapting a uh, lot, a lot of credit to you and, and everybody at the dealership. Thank you. All right. So we went through a lot during this podcast. We went through barbecue tips. We went through uh, the, the, latest on Corvettes, apprenticeship programs. Uh, 
anything you want to end with any any uh, any any thing that maybe we should discuss before we hop off very vague question by the way <laughs> well i know uh was it was it val or kayla's writing something coming up she's wanting info on i didn't want to kind of bust that out but i always get a lot of questions i always get a lot of questions on tiktok from guys that are thinking about joining this or hey my daughter's thinking about doing this do you have any suggestions and um i always say something like you know right now in the position we're in we kind of if we can diagnose a car repair it have it not come back with the same problem we're pretty much gold right now we can basically name our price and then I, right. I, I usually roll into what you've taught me is that hey the more you're paid the more expectations there's going to be so as a, as a new person get that down where you can efficiently repair a vehicle without it having a comeback and go from there just don't ask for too much up front because they're going to expect too much up front and that's if we can end with that, that'd be cool. That's solid. That's solid, solid advice. And I, I, I think for those, those young techs or those aspiring to be in this industry, find a mentor like Jason, find somebody that's going to take care of you, find somebody that cares about you and not just the productivity right off the bat, because that's going to put you miles ahead in the, in the years to come. So uh, excellent point. Excellent thing to, to end on. Uh, for those that don't follow you on TikTok, how do, how do they do that, Jason? I uh, just go to TikTok and search the Jason Olinger, and that's where I'll be. Yeah, puts out a ton of great content and uh, can't tell you how much it means to to us at Wrenchway to have you join us again. We're, we're all huge fans of everything that you do and uh, look forward to the next time. Now recurring guest, which is uh, it, it, this will be great. We'll uh, We'll get you back on again here sometime soon. All right. Sounds good, Jay. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get Beyond the Wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners, managers, technicians, and dealers just like you, so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks everyone for listening, and we'll be back next week.